So good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer. Uh, now, I put 101 up here in quotes because the one thing I want to make clear for everybody is that 101 is the stage that globally we are at with regard to circular economy. The term first appeared in 2006 in a formal context when China introduced a new regulatory framework that was only focused on recycling, but that was the first uh, national effort to include this language. So 2006 to 2020, that's not a long time in terms of the evolution of an idea. In terms of how that's changed over time, uh, in around 2010, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a nonprofit based in London, kicked off and started to try and create dialogue around what is this idea, what does it mean? And it took another five years after that until the European Union introduced its circular economy package in 2015, which is guiding framework legislation across, across all membership to try to implement circular economy. So this evolution is very new, very recent, and it's still exploratory. So 101 doesn't mean that, that nobody knows anything and we're starting fresh. It means that that's really where the conversation is at. And that's the exciting thing is because when you get this diverse group of people together, we can have good conversations and hopefully continue this acceleration. So I'm going to give an overview of the research that I have been involved in um, and then some ideas for how we can bring that context and these tools into the wood product sector, uh, the built environment conversation, because there's tons and tons of opportunity and it's really exciting. So I really appreciate being invited. Um, I always do an agenda to remind myself of what I'm actually going to be talking about. So we'll do a brief overview of what circular economy is and then how it connects with the concepts of bioeconomy and the circular carbon economy. They are interconnected, but they're not all the same. And then um, an example that I, you know, I'm trying to dig through myself. It's not a perfect example, but it's an opportunity for us to think about the work that you do and whether my analogies are, are correct. So I'm going to test the theory with you. The first thing that we bumped up against, so a bit of background on myself, I spent five years working on a United Nations project for the International Resources Panel, tasked with quantifying the benefits of circular economy globally. Um, it's a very vague scope. It took a long time to figure out how the heck we were going to do that. What we landed on was looking at the sectors that were already engaging in some sorts of activities that we might put under a circular economy banner. These were industrial uh, heavy equipment products, industrial digital printers, and automotive sectors. So my background is with a lot of heavy metals and a lot of big industry and a lot of technology. The way that we worked with that from a global perspective was that we went to Germany, United States, Brazil, and China to explore how these concepts and these ideas were being implemented differently and how the conditions there, policy, engagement, the, the latitude that businesses had to work with were actually enabling or constraining the growth and the benefits that could come out of it. But the first thing that we bumped up against was this problem of terminology. So creating a common understanding of circular economy is you know, the first challenge. And fortunately, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation put a flag in the ground in 2010 and said, this is what circular economy is, um, which I'll get to in a minute. But before I do, some of the other terminology challenges that we were coming up against what are now captured under value retention processes include recycling, which is the processing of non-organic materials to be used as an input material. Compost or other forms of, of degeneration of organic materials is focusing on the processing of organic materials, often to be used for biosphere replenishment or some other um, interim activity. Reuse is the as-is or additional as-is product service life. So this common example is you know, a hand-me-down item of clothing where you're not investing any time or effort to repair or upgrade it. It's just straight reuse, second life. Repair, I'm obviously hoping that this terminology should be clear, but there is a lot of confusion. Repair is where you have to actually invest time, some new resources, some labor into getting that product back to a functional status. You're not doing anything other than making it work again. Refurbishment is also looking at getting back to that functional status. But refurbishment tends to happen in industrialized settings through standardized processes. So refurbishment is not necessarily something that the average do-it-yourselfer is doing in a garage. Refurbishment is what Xerox is doing with their photocopiers. It's what a lot of the automotive companies are doing with their parts uh, in the secondary service parts market. And then finally, remanufacturing is a new category that is currently not even defined under most European legislation, and this created a lot of issues. But remanufacturing is all of those activities that are involved to get a product back to um, 
as new performance, which means that you're investing all of the time, the resources, the effort to get it back to performance that equates to a brand new version of that product. So in this context, refurbishment is actually adding value back into that product. And this is important because it has a higher carbon footprint than, or carbon footprint, materials footprint, all of those other impacts than the other processes, but it also adds value when we do it. So all of these terms, whether you're familiar with them or not, this was the, one of the most challenging hurdles that the United Nations team came up against when we were digging into it. So I thought it was worth presenting here. A lot of you mentioned that you have a background and experience with life cycle. So I tried to create a simple version of a common appreciation for the life cycle stages. And if we're looking at a linear economy, you start with extraction, there's some processing, design feeds into that. We end up manufacturing something, ship it all over the world or wherever it's going through distribution. It gets used and eventually reaches end of life. And there might be iterations that happen in there, but that's by and large the way most of our economies work right now. So across those process stages, as you all know, there are impacts, different kinds, whether it's a waste impact, an emissions impact, uh, fuel consumption, environmental degradation. We're very clear on how we can measure those in a linear model. When we think about what linear economy thinking involves, we have design that traditionally assumes virgin inputs, uh, and it also focuses only on manufacturing specifications and what the user is going to be doing with it. We have manufacturing processes that for the most part, fail to eliminate waste, waste in the form of material use, uh, fuel use, and time. So we might be talking about efficient production, lean production, but that's still not common practice around the world. We also have massive global distribution systems. Uh, very few people think about the impacts that come from having to ship products across the Pacific Ocean from China. Those are not traditionally captured in, you know, in life cycle assessments, they are, but in the minds of consumers and business decisions, they're left out. We have a use stage that is only focused on performance of the product, the convenience that it creates, and user satisfaction. And then we have an end of life that traditionally fails to cascade into any higher value retention opportunity. If people recycle that product, we call it a win and we give ourselves a little green check mark. So when we think about the circular economy, I'm just going to layer this on top because this is how the thinking has an opportunity to shift and change. We still have the same processes that we start out with, and this represents the first life of that product. But once it gets to the use stage, we can engage in repair. Probably everybody does this. You can repair your vehicles. You might sew the button back on your coat. Repair can be done at the individual level. It can be done in a standardized automotive shop. When we repair that, what we're able to do is offset the requirement for a new product. And that's really important when we think about reducing impact we can do direct reuse. Direct reuse is that opportunity to get it back into a distribution system for someone else to use it. Someone who is perfectly happy with its performance level and its appearance and all of those other things. So again, when we reuse something, we're offsetting the requirement to purchase a new one. Remanufacturing is a much more industrial process, as I mentioned, refurbishment as well. That's taking something from the user and going back into a production stage, an industrial setting of some sort where we put more materials, more money, and more labor relative to repair and reuse, but we get a very high performing or as new product out of it that can go back into the supply chain. And then when we get to composting, energy recovery, and recycling, we can do that from the user, recapturing it at right before that end of life stage, but we can also start to do it in the production stages. So there's lots of um, byproduct materials that are being captured as scrap off the production line, that can be then reinvested back into processing. And then finally, when we think about biosphere replenishment and the biomaterials, we're talking about bringing that all the way back to the extraction level. So from a framework perspective, when we have the circular economy thinking, we have design that incorporates the systems thinking perspective. And when we have that in mind, every time we engage in one of these cycles, we are offsetting the requirement for a new one. That is very, very meaningful when you think about the impacts that accrue across the supply chain. The more of that upstream supply chain you can cut out, the more value you retain, and the more uh, environmental benefit we can create. We have a production phase that is now focusing on waste minimization and the use of waste as a resource now, whether within your own facility or as a byproduct that you can sell as a, a commodity item. Businesses models that integrate distribution and reverse logistics. 
So most of the activities that involve, or remanufacturing are involved with also utilize all of the forward distribution systems to get those back again at end of life. So you have efficiencies in the distribution now, as well as the opportunity to get that product or material moving through the system again. If we're looking at use phase, we still prioritize performance and user satisfaction, but now we want them to be doing it across multiple service lives. If you make that a repairable product, they can keep it for a lot longer and they can do it themselves without high cost, and without a lot of time or effort. If you make it durable, they can reuse it, pass it on to their friends or their children, or they just keep it themselves for a lot longer than they normally would. A common um, example for this is if you think about fashion. You know, the longer that, you know, the more classic the design, the more durable the fabric, that can last 10 or 15 years instead of the five month cycle that we see a lot of consumers engaging in right now. And then finally, at that end of use phase, it's actually not end of life anymore. What we're talking about is reaching that point which it is no longer wanted by the owner, but it has so much value back in the system that we could recapture and use it for. So we're looking at this as end of use and an opportunity to cascade that back into value retention processes. So this is high level thinking and high level framework. For me, this way of looking at circular economy is a lot more, I guess, familiar than looking at the Ellen MacArthur diagram, which involves a lot of circles and a lot of arrows and not a lot of clarity. But if we apply it to the way we traditionally think about life cycles and the opportunities to cascade, then hopefully that starts to create a better you know, foundational understanding. Um, oh, and the one <laughs> I forgot to click. I'm, I'm big on animation, I'm sorry. Um, the multi-cycling and cascading options that exist when something reaches end of life even if it's no longer with the, the user, it can go into a reuse stream. It can be repaired and put back out there. Refurbishment, remanufacturing, recycling, as we mentioned before, but also composting and energy recovery. Even when something has been reused six times, remanufactured five times, and now there's absolutely nothing else that we can do with it, we still have energy recovery opportunities where the infrastructure and system exists. So this is a diagram that <laughs> Thankfully, uh, the team I was working with accepted when I proposed it. It describes a way of thinking about the marketplace in a way that businesses can appreciate and understand and forces a circular economy perspective. So I apologize for the small font, I'll explain it quickly. Down here we have domestic production. That can be brand new production, it can also be remanufacturing or direct reuse or for, for whatever activity that is, except for repair. Coming into production we have recycled materials which are the green arrows. Domestic cores or reuse streams, which are the blue arrows, imported, and then virgin materials, which are coming directly from the environment, which are orange arrows. Everything comes into a production system, we turn it into something, and then it either, we have a waste stream into the, the environment, we may be able to recycle things into commodities markets, finished products go for export, or they're directed into a domestic marketplace, which is up at the top. I won't use this, I'll break it, I'm sure. But when we look at the marketplace, we also have to account for the fact that it's not just domestic production that we're thinking about, it's also everything that comes in that gets imported and where that comes from. If we're are importing from a developed economy that's advanced in its thinking and has environmental policy and law that we can have confidence in you know, how responsibly it is created, that's great. But most of our products are not coming from those jurisdictions. So we need to account for the differential in the footprint and the environmental impact there. So all of these things flow into a marketplace. People use them, they buy them, hopefully they enjoy them. If they want to repair it or maintain it, we can cycle it directly back into that marketplace with the user. We do maintenance. We have to, we have to have some recycled materials or virgin materials go into the new part. You know, if your alternator breaks on your car, the new one that goes in there has to be made of something. So we account for that marginal addition. And the waste one is going to come out of your vehicle and it's going to be recycled or put into scrap. So if we're accounting for all of these flows, from a repair perspective, a little bit has to be put in new and a little bit of loss has to be accounted for. And you can repair something many, many times before it finally reaches an end of use stage coming out the other side where uh, hopefully there's a collection and diversion system for it. Depending on how that happens, if it's a drop off for your clothing, if it's uh, an industrial uh, service arrangement with Caterpillar to come and pick up the excavator and take it back so you don't have to worry about it. In any case, there are three options for that material. It could be disposed into the environment, it could be routed into a recycling market at the materials level, or it could be 
scrapped and salvaged for parts as a reuse activity. So I'm sure you've read the headline there, but the emphasis when we talk about circular economy can't be on waste. If we think about waste, which has predominantly been where the thinking is so far, where waste happens, it happens everywhere. It's incredibly difficult to manage. It depends on the facility, it depends on the user, the consumer, what's happening there. And there's lots of different kinds of waste. Disposal to the environment includes solid waste, but it also includes emissions and effluent and all of those other things that we're dumping out there and hoping won't have a terrible impact. But if we shift away from waste and instead start thinking about value, we can recognize that we create value during production processes, varying degrees of value, economic value, but also utility, performance, consumer satisfaction, brand loyalty, all of these good things, their value. When we maintain and repair them, that's also creating value. That's a service provision by the economy that generates money and jobs. In the marketplace, we're really worried about how consumers perceive value. Whether they decide to repair something or reuse something or buy the remanufactured option, depends on how they understand the performance, the quality of that item. Most people, maybe the, the clearest way to relate to this is, does anybody here maybe hesitate with the idea of going to Goodwill to buy a chair or a couch? There's a, a very common reaction um, amongst people that, like, I don't really want that, so I don't know what the person before me has done with it. I don't know where it came from. It, it's an ick factor. There's something that prevents us from being willing to use something in its current format when we don't know where it came from and we don't know if it's new. It might be contaminated some way. So perceptions of consumers of reuse, repair, refurbished, remanufactured items is a huge hurdle for making the system work. If they do not demand it, then businesses see no business value, no business case for it, and they will not engage in the production activity of it. So most of this has to happen in the marketplace with consumer education. That's where a lot of my research goes. And then finally, we need the systems that help us to main or retain that value. So life cycle thinking, you account for all of the emissions, all of that environmental footprint, the materials values that are invested in a product upstream. If we don't recapture that, that's a heck of a lot of lost value. And it's compounds. Not only do we lose it when it goes to landfill, it means that somebody has to go buy a new one. So we've actually doubled it or even tripled it in some cases by failing to capture it and retain it in some way. So I'm just going to put these all up here. You can read. <laughs> um, the circular economy principles, Ellen MacArthur Foundation has presented three of them, but they're not easy to grasp. They're a little bit vague. Uh, the circle economy has put forward a, a maybe more specific version of this. So. In the context here, we prioritize the use of regenerative resources. So rather than mixed plastics that have no possible end of life other than energy recovery, uh, well, let's look at the more uh, regenerative options, reusable, renewable, and non-toxic. Preserving and extending what's already in use, what's already made. So we have a bunch of things that are out in the marketplace right now that we need to figure out a system for. It's almost a parallel tract. We have a problem right now that we need to solve based on all of the legacy items and materials and decisions that have created a situation we have now. At the same time, we also are currently investing in new ideas, new innovations that are, and with example here, bio-based, you know, new wood products that can replace the plastic options or the steel options or the cement options. But just because we're focused on the new items of the future, we still need to look at this existing stock of terrible things that we need to deal with, that we need to create circular systems for, and we need to figure out how to recover and retain that value. Using waste as a resource and being creative about that, uh, rethinking the business model. So in addition to consumers perceiving the value in the marketplace of these different options, businesses who are looking at this practice also have to shift their thinking. Are they selling a high performance, high turnover product. Um, if anyone's heard about the concept of circular fashion, which has become a big deal in, the, in at least New York City and uh, Europe right now, this is looking at the provision of fashion, not as something that needs to happen on a cyclical basis, but instead maybe a service, service that allows people to engage in changing fashion and changing culture in a way that doesn't require them to cons keep consuming and buying and disposing of it. Other examples of business models, uh, especially relevant for the built environment, is the idea of product as service. So I think Philips is presenting lighting where they don't sell you the light fixture, they actually turn it into a service contract 
where you pay by the lumens consumed. So instead of selling you the product, they sell you a service arrangement. That not only motivates you to use less lumens as a building operator, but it also creates a financial incentive and re shifts the emphasis of that relationship. So there's a lot of innovation that's happening with businesses and how they reach the marketplace and create value in a new way that they haven't done before. And then finally, designing for the future, which is definitely not last. It's actually the most important piece of this. And so I wanted to finish this slide on that point. None of this is going to be possible if we don't stop and think at the beginning of our design process about the decisions we're making. If we put toxic materials in these new products, these new things we're designing, they won't be anything that can go into the environment afterwards. We won't be able to do anything with that other than hopefully send it for incineration and maybe some energy recovery. So the use of those materials is really important. But from a design perspective, we also have to make it repairable. Does anybody have an iPhone? Has anybody ever needed to replace the battery or the screen and not been able to do that? So from a consumer perspective, right now, you have companies that are deliberately designing products so that they can't be repaired. They say it's in the name of consumer safety and security, but it works really brilliantly for them because you cannot go anywhere else to repair it. You have to come to them and they will charge you for it. So they've created a whole new service model, revenue model for them by restricting those repair opportunities. Design's also important when you think of the end of life. So design for disassembly, modular design, our ability to go into a building and with nothing other than a drill that you can you know, click the reverse button on to take the screws out, that's, that's a design innovation that has to be thought of 25 years before that building is ever going to need to be disassembled. So thinking about that whole system, that whole cycle, that whole end of life, it's not going to be possible for everything, but at the very least, we need to be allowing for one additional life cycle. Repair, reuse, remanufacturing, refurbishment, even composting. If we put anything out into the marketplace right now that has no other option but landfill, then we are absolutely not thinking in a circular way and we are designing our own future. So hopefully familiar, this nice cradle to grave perspective in the linear economy. This is based on the model that I did my work on for the United Nations. Like how do you quantify the benefits of something? Our approach was to compare it to the incumbent status quo, the brand new version of it, the OEM new, You'll see that term in my slides. So if we think about in a traditional life cycle, the benefit that's created by going through extraction, processing, fabrication, blah, 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 through to the customer use, you create income for all the people that work in that system through revenue and employment, and for the companies, obviously. An additional benefit comes from the utility and function to the consumer that they get when they take it home and use it, or your customer that uses it in their building product or whatever it is that they do. So these are the benefits that we get under a traditional linear system. So over the course of the product's life, in a linear economy, we get revenue, employment, and utility. But sacrifices along that way are all of the costs and impacts of that product life. And traditionally, decisions made in businesses and by consumers come down to this equation. You're about to go into a store, you're going to say, is the utility, the benefit I get from using this, buying this, greater than how much it costs? Good, I'll buy it. Now your utility, your assessment of utility is going to be made of all different things that are very personal to you, um, but this is the equation that you use to do it. When we expand this and think from a systems view perspective, we have to acknowledge that with a linear system, we get absolutely no benefits from an end of use or end of life perspective. And we have to add up all of these costs, not just the monetary costs, but the finite resource consumption that's happening, waste generation, ecosystem damage and degradation, and the social implications. Social implications include capitalism, industrialization, and exploitation, because a lot of this product life is not happening in the domestic US, it's happening in developing countries where we do not see the same human rights standards, labor standards, or environmental standards. So if we were to then switch this to a circular economy context, we have composting, which takes end of life back to a primary processing stage, using now that compost as a material input into your garden or your farm. We look at benefits now as we create a revenue and employment that is achieved by recycling this, right? So people have to collect that, people have to process it. That's, that's economic activity, that's value. 
we also are able to retain that material value. So that's benefit that's created because we don't have to go out and find it somewhere else through a virgin, uh, virgin source. But we also need to account for the costs and the impacts that are offset by recycling. In this case, we don't have to go back to the environment and extract it. So those costs include emissions avoided, uh, fuel use avoided, environmental degradation avoided. We still need to account for all of the costs and impacts that happen in that first life. And we still need to add the fact that there are going to be costs and impacts associated with recycling. I'm definitely not going to stand here and tell you that aluminum recycling is, has no environmental footprint. It has a huge energy footprint. And depending on the, the energy source, if it's coal, it, it's very harmful to recycle aluminum. So we can't ignore that recycling has a burden. What we need to do is then evaluate the, the benefits that are created through that versus the costs. When we look at direct, direct reuse now, and this is where the big opportunity comes in, we're taking it from end of use back to an inventory stage. That means we're offsetting a heck of a lot more of that upstream supply chain impact. We're still creating value through the employment opportunity and the revenue stream opportunity, assuming that you do it uh, you know, through a platform, not just a hand-me-down. But we offset a significant amount of the upstream supply chain impact, and now, we only have to account for the new life cycle impact that happens from the inventory through to the use stage. So we increase the benefit and we decrease the sacrifice in that second life. We still have some impacts from direct reuse. We don't want to pretend that it's perfect. Um, there was another one with recycling, but I don't want to be repetitive. You get the idea. It's, it's ba balancing now the benefits versus the sacrifices that are made. So, when I did this work for the United Nations, just to provide a basis for this, this is quantifiable. This is something we can demonstrate and go back to again and again. This chart is also hard to read, so I apologize. The top chart is the impacts of industrial digital printers. This is a traditional vehicle engine in the US, and this is heavy duty and off-road equipment, excavators, big giant mining trucks. The gray bars represent the impacts that you get from an OEM new version. So what you'll see across all of these lines is that relative to the impacts of OEM new, in terms of the new materials, virgin material requirement, we see at least an 80% reduction, at least. When we look at the embodied energy, again, we see at least an 80% reduction. Embodied energy, in this case, is speaking about all of the fuel and energy consumption that went into making those new materials that are used. Embodied emissions, in this case, these are, these are metals, so I'm not talking about any kind of bio-based that might already have some carbon or um, carbon that's embedded. This is strictly embodied emissions from those processing activities upstream. We see, again, a minimum of 20% reduction. The process energy, once it gets to that remanufacturing plant or that repair shop, we see a minimum of uh, around 60% reduction. And then the associated emissions from that process, again, a minimum of 60% reduction. So this clearly demonstrates that the benefit of even designing it to be reused once creates at least a 60% reduction, as much as 95% reduction, relative to someone buying a new version of that product. So even the most basic improvement in the design and distribution plan creates huge, huge impact. We see this across all of the value retention processes that were studied. Um, and you see the variation in some of those bars, acknowledging that remanufacturing, an industrialized process, it tends to have more emissions and more impact, but it's still reducing to 60%. Um, we were also charged with looking at the economic impacts. So, on, Obviously, these are great from an environmental perspective. Why should anybody invest in it? What's the business case? Um, what you'll see here, again, I apologize for the small font. The gray bar represents employment. How many new full-time equivalent people need to be involved in that? Yellow bar represents cost. In this case, the base was US dollars. Um, and then the brown bar represents the production waste associated with it. And production waste is an economic factor because currently, Facilities have to pay to have that hauled away. So the less you create, the lower your operating costs. If you're able to convert it into a byproduct and sell it as a new revenue stream, even better. So relative to OEM new, which is in this side, we see um, 
huge reductions in the, the cost associated with production waste generation, like in the 95% range. Um, in the cost perspective, we see significant reduction, especially for reuse and repair. And obviously those are lower investment ac activities. But even for refurbishment and remanufacturing, we still see a cost reduction. And that's because companies that are reusing cores, they don't have to spend as much on materials. And they've avoided a lot of the processing activities that they've had to do. And the big thing that created a lot of interest for these economies is the fact that when you increase your remanufacturing and your refurbishment activities, you create jobs. You increase the employment opportunity because those are labor intensive, highly skilled jobs, and now you need more of them. So this now translates into an economic opportunity that policymakers are interested in. So taking all of this context, it's about value creation and value retention, economic as well as environmental, we layer it on top of the Alan MacArthur uh, and World Economic Forum diagram, which is very beautiful, um, but also complex. So to break this down and figure out how do we remanufacturing and wood products of the built environment, they don't seem to go together quite easily. But if we break this down and understand how these all fit, we have the bioeconomy, which involves extraction from the environment, manufacturing, a couple of them, ultimately distribution to the consumer, and then they can use it, reuse it, whatever they want to do. Maybe it goes to energy recovery, but perhaps it goes to biochemical conversion at the end of its life. Maybe we can use anaerobic digestion or composting to deal with it. Perhaps we can get biogas out of it as a fuel offset. Worst case scenario, if we have a system in place, we can send it for biosphere restoration and can cycle it back through. And it sounds like a beautiful process and a beautiful vision. In the United States, we don't have a lot of infrastructure for this right now. We don't have a lot of policy to help facilitate that. But if this is the vision, this gives us a roadmap on how we can start to work towards that. On this side of the diagram, if you're familiar with it, it's often called the technical nutrient flows, but really this is about stocks and flows of products and materials. These are things that are durable and that retain value after their first use. So as we've talked about before, you manufacture something, goes through, you sell it, you buy, or they sell it, you buy it. As a user, you can rep repair and maintain it. You could reuse it and redistribute it. You could remanufacture it. And at the very end, if you're familiar with the waste hierarchy, Reduce, reuse, recycle, only at the end of trying to reduce and trying to reuse. Then you recycle in the outer loop and you capture those materials values at the end of it. This is where the circular carbon economy fits in. And basically, as long as we don't lose those materials into the <coughs> landfill, the elemental side of these economies, they, they can flow across both sides. Um, in the, the framework note that was distributed, there was that big brown circle that cut across both. If we're looking at this from the carbon perspective, we're cycling carbon if we're reusing and repairing. We're also recycling or we're also capturing carbon if we're going a biogas route or going through a restoration route. So the carbon economy exists on both sides of this. So an example I'm going to walk through, this is where I'm experimenting with you and going to test this theory. And I've talked a lot, but if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Yeah? On the last slide, you talked about, it looks like a landfill, they're outside the system of um, I mean, you could think of a landfill as a carbon sink, but if we don't have technology to go out and, and use it or do anything with it, I mean, it's holding that embodied carbon, but we're not quantifying it. We don't know what's in there. We can't even account for what's in landfills as a way of contributing to this sequestration effort, for example. So if we're thinking about cycling carbon, the landfill is, it's a dead end, at least until we want to engage in landfill mining. And so. What about methane recapture? Because the, mm -hmm. they are doing methane recapture, aren't they? Yep. Can they? So yeah. would methane recapture change that little, so that it would be included? I will absolutely this. So that's a really good question. Um, when I thought about methane recapture, I was thinking this as an almost as an energy recovery strategy. Um, landfill, I'm thinking of the, the covered landfills that we don't tap into, that we don't do anything with. This has a, a flame though, so incineration is the first thing, you know, even if it's for, for, bi or for energy recovery. Um, but that's also, it's a good question. Where should methane recapture fit?
a few of more comments and questions. So my work, building materials and, for example, numbers, a huge part of recovery and use, mm -hmm. recycling, obviously. Uh, it seems that the comparisons with printers and very high uh, valuable metallic products and high technology. Um, so we, it's kind of the opposite. We can create a lot of employment, but actually it never costs less because the labor is high relative to material. I'm assuming, or maybe you can clarify, and so the products you're looking at, materials are very high compared to labor intensity. I don't know if that's pointing that out or asking the question, but you know, where material itself, body product, like an upper, mm -hmm. and then labor is really the main part. It's not cheaper to have more labor even though it's going to kind of work for us and, you know, great kind of policy that you're creating jobs. It's not really work. It's an excellent point. I'm really glad you brought it up, actually. So wood products and lumber has not been talked about in a circular economy context. This has not been touched. Despite, despite all of the acceleration of interest in research, there is very little on quantifying whether and how we create benefits through the cycling of, of wood products and other biomaterials. And so that's, I have a model that works really well for excavators. My challenge coming up in the future is to see, does that model still work for, for bio-based materials or the, the lower value materials in this case? Uh, so the answer is nobody knows. Um, and one of the questions I want to put out here is to provoke that conversation. Is there a value in looking at how much benefit is created by cycling wood-based building products? By the way, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, looking at this, I was f fully expecting we might do a little bit of paradigm busting today and tomorrow. So that's why we're here, to really take this on. I think it was Kuma at the very, at the very beginning of the conversation way back when, when we were talking about this in the summer, who said, well, you know, the Ellen MacArthur people don't really look at wood products. I was like, well, that's a perfect opportunity. You bring together the wood guys and figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. And, and just to build on that, exactly, I mean, there have been various theories as to why wood products haven't been researched and at the part, but what, what's your take on that? They just haven't gotten to it yet, or it's not fundamentally part of it? The the big interests that I've seen getting funding, the research questions, are grounded in technology and heavy industry, um, where wood doesn't traditionally exist. Because that's where the research efforts have been happening, the conclusions that people have been coming to are exactly that. Well, this only works if you have high value products in high value value chains where industry is willing to invest in building their own reverse logistics system. Nobody's going to subsidize that. So the conclusion, because of where all of this work started, in in the technical materials side of it, is that wood hasn't even come in, uh, along with other many other materials. Um, and the early conclusions that, oh, for it to be a viable business case, it needs to have economic value at end of life. So it's been dismissed. But as we move towards resource scarcity and the number one pillar of a circular economy is the shift to renewable resources, we need to actually start incorporating the renewable resources into the analysis. Now that's based on where, who I've been speaking with, that heavy tech or heavy industry and high technology emphasis is why this remains a blind spot. I think part of it is because the, the construction industry within the U.S. is still operating under very, very archaic models. Um, you know, compared to the European Union uh, or compared to other industries within the U.S. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about the yeah. Well, they're very disparate parts to the construction industry uh, that don't really talk to each other very much. They're all very siloed. Um, and the, the systems by which manufacturing virgin materials, design, um, you know, the C and D construction and demolition, put those two words together. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're based on empty models and the, the, the manufacturing and distribution communities for, for most other industries uh, have become much more high tech and much more advanced uh, than the uh, construction industry has. And there's reasons for that, a lot of reasons, and part of what Those aren't good reasons. 
Yeah. My it, this one of the reasons is it's just because it works. Like construction mm -hmm. from two by four, it's still affordable. It is still efficient. It still works, and it's very difficult to convince everybody else to go for something new, even more uh, uh, sophisticated and more expensive. So mm -hmm. cost is playing a very important role. And part of it goes into how we how we. Definitely, yeah, I, I know there was another yeah. comment. Um, I, I think there's an interesting comment in terms of, uh, of looking at the value of the raw material in itself, and you know, you know, some aspects are you know, really um, advantageous to recycle because of those costs associated with it. But I think also where, where there's opportunity in wood products, types of things or natural materials, is once you put value into it by construction of a new component or part or things along that line. So certainly in mass timber, you now have a lot of value that you place into it with labor and with other components of that, that then there's opportunity for reuse. But I think the other part, and the part that might be missing in the traditional view, and it's always the view yeah. that I've struggled with circular economies in terms of applying yeah. this, is, is that somebody, somebody sort of challenged me actually just about a month ago on this sort of topic, is that it's the view of, 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 of returning maybe CO2 into the in atmosphere and then recovering it again through the growth of forest and the production of the new material itself. And having that view in, its, in and of itself on that. And I think there's opportunities for us from the climate standpoint of returning carbon back to a geologic source, right? There's a lot of processes and fuels and chemicals that you can actually produce a solid carbon. You can put that carbon back into geologic sources and start to move conceptually carbon negative into some of those sorts of fronts. So, it's, so, so it is a different um, idea set in terms of what can be done with these renewable materials and how these all go together in there. Absolutely. That sort of standpoint. And yeah. Whereas this applies certain cases of maybe higher value building products or different things like that. But being able to recycle into other types of materials, you know, take a, a yeah. wood waste, do a biochemical process, make a plastic out of it. Yeah. Completely so agree. We have one more comment from Kuma, and then we're going to keep going. I'm glad you guys are listening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to give an explanation as to why Ellen MacArthur does not include wood products. And I, I chair the American Center for Life Cycle Assessment uh, Policy Committee, and I've engaged Ellen MacArthur staff probably about 10 to 12 hours worth of conversation so far, trying to get them engaged in the uh, American Center for Life Cycle Assessment, actually for them to have a circular economy session on it, and they have so far refused to do that, but there's one good reason, but there's one good reason why uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation does not want to give wood products a leg up in the marketplace, because they fear that if the demand increases, that it will decimate the Borneo Island, it will decimate the Amazon forest. They said, there's nothing you can do. You can call SFI all day long. What happens in the Borneo Island will be completely devastating. So therefore, they have, as an organization, they have taken a decision that wood products will not be given any leg up in any methodology that they would do, unless and until, I suppose, you know, we are ready to address the global demand for wood products. So, they really fear. In fact, they look at cross-laminated timber and they say, what a waste. What an awful product. That's, that's how they think. Because they fear what will happen in, in other parts of the world if the demand for wood products increase. So, so the real concern they have is, you know, how can we address a higher demand? You think you can replace steel? Ha, ha, ha. What will happen to the forest? Who will replant them? Who's going to maintain sustainability in the global sphere. I, I don't know whether it's a valid concern or not, but that's their concern. I completely agree. Um, and that's where the huge opportunity is, because if we emphasize design that utilizes recycled content, recycled content of wood and wood materials, or reuse or recapture, repurposing of those materials, we can create a new secondary stream, the same as what exists for steel and aluminum, for bio-based materials. So this is a theory. They don't know this, if this exists anywhere yet. I don't know if any of you are working on this. But that is, that is why we can talk about steel and aluminum in these ways, is because there are alternatives to virgin extraction. 
And until we can figure out alternative subversion extraction for forests, perhaps it's not an issue for wood production in the US, but it definitely is for developing countries around the world. So what's the alternative to virgin extraction so that we can tell the right story and educate consumers so that they're not demanding teak hardwood floors, but rather domestic species. So an example that was given to me last night. Um, so that's where the design and innovation really has a huge opportunity here. We don't have the existing systems. Perhaps we don't have the existing technology. I don't know, but that's, that's the big opportunity here. How do you create secondary markets out of this that offset the virgin requirement? Yes. Uh, but the criticism that comes from the wood is more on the government side uh, that what happens to deforestation, yes. unmanaged resources, rather than virgin extraction. Because even if yep. we talk about steel and aluminum, a virgin extraction happens all over the world yes. in an ungoverned way, mm -hmm. and over extraction happens. Definitely. But when it comes to wood, we become a little bit more sensitive. So, well, we're losing yeah. control. Yeah. <laughs> My, Alan has to make a comment. Yes. Shut it off so she can finish. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to say, I think the point that you just raised um, is really important. Uh, we have to distinguish between intrinsic impact flaws in a, a material and circumstantial ones. In its fixed circumstances, we can't change the chemistry of steel, alloys of steel, and aluminum. So I think, I think we have to operate in terms of what we can, how we can move. Forest as a virgin resource, which is means deforestation, if you use it, is a flawed conception. And I think that's something we should talk about. In some types of rules. In some circumstances, of yes. course, no. Uh, it obviously, yeah. And acknowledging that all of that, the reason that deforestation is happening is because there is a market for those materials. And there is high demand and there are prices that match. So as long as that's actually not right. No? Okay, then I take it back. Let me I'm not an expert. Know. But I will. Yeah. I take it back. Sincere apologies. I'm going to finish with my very, very quick example of wood pallets because this is more my area of knowledge and expertise. So if we look at how the life cycle of wood pallets are traditionally viewed, starts with raw materials and ends with some sort of recycling activity, which is good. Recycling is on, on the agenda here. At the end of life of pallets, we know that 20% tend to get reused, 45% are refurbished and sent back into the market, 19% are recycled, 15% are ground, and only 1% are landfilled. Um, that's work that's been done by Buhlman. Uh, so we know a lot about what's happening in the, the whole big system of pallets. If we look at this in the context of bioeconomy, forgive my terrible art, but we start with farming and collection. The analogy for wood is that it is cultivated in a forest, and then it is harvested and sent through some manufacturing processes to create a pallet. In the pallet industry, the most of that does not come from virgin sources. It's coming as byproduct from some other activity, but acknowledging that at one point in time it came from a forest. If we flip over to the, the other side then, where pallets start to intersect with this, you know, now we've got some material, a product that can cross over. As a pallet, it goes into a user, and we are seeing that they maintain and repair them in the first life. Maybe in its second life, it gets remanufactured, upgraded to some degree. It's you know, cycling multiple times. And then at the end of that, it can have infinite opportunities for upcycling, where it's moving around the exterior uh, cycle in there. And upcycling is often done in a do-it-yourself context where people take these pallets and create garden furniture or other home accessories. Some of these are sold uh, in the marketplace. But then when we, when we get to that end of life, uh, the suitable options that exist, it can be uh, chipped or mulched, which is a downcycling activity, returns it to this type of format, which is a cascading activity. It might be sent for incineration through pelletization and energy for pelletization and recovery. Um, or those pellets might be sent for biogas and other bioenergy applications. So the fascinating thing with wood that I think there's huge opportunity here that's worth exploring is the fact that we have a material that works on both sides of these systems. 
and that can engage many different stakeholders throughout the value chain. And ultimately, if it goes into a biosphere uh, restoration application, then it contributes back into the cycle. So wrapping up really quickly, <laughs> my main message here is that we need to think in a systems perspective. Whatever the solution is, and there needs to be one, um, it needs to start with design. Not designing really brilliant, durable, innovative products that still have nowhere to go, even in 30 years, 100 years, when that building is finally deconstructed. Innovating so that we have technology and other solutions, systemic solutions, to ensure that we can address these issues of deforestation at the same time as we move forward with refurbishment, remanufacturing op opportunities. And ultimately, we need to expand the scope of how these discussions are happening. So whether that's including non-traditional stakeholders, non-traditional cycling opportunities, and building out the research network. So that was really my segue into, this is why we're all here, as Elaine has said many times, and I will close up there. <laughs>